So we're going to go ahead and pick up with generating local potentials. And a local potential is basically going to be a stimulation that occurs within the dendrites or the soma of an axon to initiate the cascade of events that lead towards signal generation. Now the whole process starts with the stimulation. And this stimulation can come from a variety of different uh, stimuli or different um, examples. So it could be from some sort of chemical that's in the air and then it hits the olfactory nerve and causes this local potential to be produced. Um, so maybe this chemical is the smell of a cat. You walk into a room and there's a cat in there and you can smell the cat. And so there's that cat smell in the air and that's coming from molecules that are being released by that animal. And those molecules that are released into the air, you breathe them in through your nose and that molecule binds a receptor. Now that receptor, this is a protein, uh, it's going to be a protein receptor and it's going to be located on a neuron. Typically these are going to be found on a dendrite of that neuron. So the molecule binds to that receptor. The receptor is located within the membrane of the dendrite of the neuron. And when that receptor is bound up, it's bound by a ligand, and that ligand will act to open the gate. So we've got a ligand-gated receptor that is stimulated to open up. Now, this particular receptor, it's ligand-gated, so it is going to open up and it is going to begin to allow ions to cross. So sodium begins to cross into the cell. It's going down its concentration gradient. So from a high concentration of sodium to a low concentration of sodium. And as sodium crosses the membrane and enters into the cell, you have the intracellular fluid that's right up next to the membrane. So right at the membrane. So the fluid that is right in this close vicinity where those receptors have just been opened up by a ligand, sodium or ion begins to pour in. In the fluid right there, the intracellular fluid right there at the membrane, because you have sodium with its positive charge entering into the, into the cell, that intracellular fluid increases in voltage, increases in charge. Normally, as you'll remember, we have a resting membrane potential right around minus 70 millivolts. Now we're adding in the positives from the sodium, and this causes that minus 70 millivolts to increase closer to zero millivolts. You should recognize this change from minus 70 millivolts, which is polarized, to zero millivolts, which is not polarized, as a depolarization event. So we have depolarization that begins to occur after that ligand, the molecule from the smell of the cat, binds to that receptor on the neuron, on the dendrite. Sodium begins to change the composition and the voltage of the intracellular fluid right there by the membrane. Now as the sodium enters into the intracellular fluid, it's going to begin to disperse out along the membrane. And so it's going to begin to travel down from its relatively high concentration where it enters towards or away from that, that uh, receptor. So this is up towards other parts of the dendrite and towards the soma of the neuron, primarily traveling right there along the membrane in that intracellular fluid. Now, there is a part of 
the neuron, and that's what you can see here in this upper figure as the sodium moves along, as other receptors open up and more sodium pours in, we move towards this thing called the trigger zone. So this signal, this local potential, moves along the membrane of the dendrite and of the soma and comes up on this region called the trigger zone. Now, once you get to the trigger zone, we're actually going to then send the signal down the axon. And it's no longer going to be a local potential, something stimulated in this first portion of the neuron, but it's going to become a action potential. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But before we get to the action potential, before we get to what's happening here at the trigger zone, I want to provide a few characteristics few characteristics of local potentials. <clears throat> so local potentials are said to be graded. And these graded local potentials, this means that the larger and or the longer the stimuli, so maybe we have a large number of molecules or a large amount of pressure or it could be a large uh, amount of um, heat from, let's say we're burning our hand or something like that. We have a large, long or large and long stimuli. This results in more, an increased number of channels that open. So the increased number of channels, just like this receptor here, are going to respond and they're going to open up. This means more sodium can enter into the dendrite. And so that means a larger vocal potential signal that can be generated. In addition to being the great, uh, I'm sorry, graded, we also have a characteristic called decrement. So local, poten local potentials are decremental. And what that means is they will lose their signal strength as that signal moves away from the point of stimulation. And I'm just going to refer to that as down the membrane. So in other words, as the signal moves along the membrane, let's say that our point of contact is right here, we'll have a large amount of signal, I'm going to draw it like this, that slowly degrades as we move away. So lots of sodium enters here, but the sodium disperses out, and so there's less and less sodium as we move along until we get to a point where there's no longer a large enough change in voltage to have any sort of effect. So the local potential only can move a short amount of distance. It will only have short distance effects. You can't move a local potential with its characteristics all the way down an axon that could be a couple meters long from the spinal cord down to the very tip of the toe. A third characteristic is that local potentials are reversible. This means that we can have a loss of stimuli. When sodium begins to enter the cell, that's more positive than enter the cell. You'll remember that potassium, K+, plus, relatively high inside of the cell at rest. As more positives come in in the form of sodium, they begin to force potassium out of the cell because like charges repel. So we're going to have this potassium outflow that's going to go alongside of the sodium influx that is going to act to counter the loss of sodium. Now, a last characteristic of the local potential 
is a characteristic called polarization variability. And that polarization variability, we can have the local potential that polarizes in either direction. So in other words, depolarizes or becomes increasingly polarized. If we have an excitatory response, we're going to call that excitation, there's going to be a depolarization event that occurs. And that depolarization creates a local potential that is ready for the generation of an action potential. And that's what we primarily have been discussing up to this point. But we do have some variability in the polarization. Not only can we have excitation, but we can also have inhibition. And so we can have an inhibitory ligand rather than binding to the ligand or to the receptor and opening the channel, this is actually going to cause an inhibitory reaction. An example here, by the way, of an inhibitory ligand is going to be a molecule called glycine. So we may have glycine that binds as a ligand to a receptor. And rather than depolarizing the dendrite, we have hyperpolarization that occurs. In that hyperpolarization, we go from our resting membrane potential of minus 70 millivolts toward minus 85 or more millivolts. Now what happens here as we hyperpolarize and we go more negative, then even if we get an excitatory signal that comes in, we have a much greater distance that we need to go here before we generate a local potential. We have to go now from not minus 70 millivolts towards zero, but minus 85 towards zero. And so this means that we are less likely for an action potential to be generated. Now, when we do have an excitatory signal that comes in and generates a local potential, and that signal moves to the trigger zone, we're going to have a change in the characteristics of the signal here at the trigger zone leading into the axon. We're going to generate what's known as an action potential. So an action potential. Now, the action potential is going to be generated when that local potential, that influx, that influx of sodium into the cell travels to the trigger zone contained within the axon hillock of the neuron. Okay, so this portion is also called the axon hillock. This is the base of the axon, if you will, contains this area called the trigger zone. Now, what changes in order for an action potential rather than a local potential to be generated? And what changes is the dendrites and the soma of the neuron, the membranes of these two regions of the neuron have a very low density of ion channels. So this low density, we may generate some potential and some sort of signal, but because there's a low density of ion channels, we can't maintain that signal. And so by not being able to maintain that signal, we only have a decremental signal, a signal that has loss that's going to be generated. But when we get to the axon hillock, into that trigger zone, the fundamental difference here is that we have an increase in density 
of ion channels. So as long as that local potential was strong enough that it didn't peter out before we got to the trigger zone, when we enter this high density area, high density ion, cha ion channel area of the trigger zone contained within the axon hillock, if that local potential was strong enough, so with a strong enough local potential, that potential or that voltage signal will allow or cause these high density ion channels, a large number of ion channels within the axon hillock and the trigger zone to respond and open up. So these are going to be voltage gated ion channels responding to that change in voltage brought in by the local potential. Now, when these channels open and ions begin to cross, carrying their charge, we are going to see a change in the membrane potential within the trigger zone. And we're going to call that depolarization. Now, in the trigger zone, when we have depolarization here within that region, we are now going to no longer be generating a local potential, but a new type of potential called an action potential, which I'm going to abbreviate as AP. Okay, so we got this action potential that has been generated. Go back one picture here. So here is what an action potential signature is going to look like. You can see here in each of these areas, this is an example of what the membrane would look like. And here is the flux and if influx and outflow of sodium and potassium during this whole event. Each of these kind of one, two, three, four, five, six, each of these areas have different things happening at the membrane, different uh, exchanges of ions. And we're going to go through this figure here in just a second. Okay, so notice that we're at minus 70 millivolts, and then we're going to have some sort of stimuli that occurs. That stimuli, if you haven't already figured it out, that stimuli is going to be our local potential. So that axon hillock trigger zone is going to be sitting at resting membrane potential, minus 70 millivolts. And it will be disrupted by our local potential. So our local potential comes in from the dendrite in the soma. And if it's strong enough, it will disrupt that minus 70 millivolts. Now, that first initial stimuli from the local potential causes a small number of sodium, uh, of, of voltage-gated sodium channels to open up. So sodium at the axon hillock will undergo depolarization. So it depolarizes the membrane. So the sodium comes in because of the action potential, I'm sorry, the local potential. So if it's a big enough local potential, this results in enough sodium to enter into the axon hillock, and this begins to depolarize the membrane. So we begin to see this upswing in voltage. Now, if that local potential is big enough, so if we have a big enough or large enough local potential, and it exceeds about minus 55 millivolts, which this is going to be what's known as the threshold or the gate threshold. So if the signal comes in and it's big enough to cause an increase 
to minus 55 millivolts. So the local potential brings in enough sodium, we get to minus 55 millivolts, we are going to begin to cause a large number of sodium channels to open up. If the stimulus isn't big enough, we'll just have this little blip and nothing will really happen. We actually won't generate a full action potential and we'll just settle back down to minus 70 millivolts and no signal will be generated. But if we do reach, reach our threshold, then we'll have a host of things that will begin to happen. That threshold, or gate threshold, the voltage-gated sodium channels that are embedded here in the axon hillock will respond to that change in voltage brought in by our local potential, and they will begin to open. And they open very quickly. So they're going to open up almost immediately allowing sodium to begin to enter into the axon hillock. At the same time or near the same time, we're also going to have voltage-gated potassium channels that will be stimulated to open. But they open much slower, which means there's going to be a lag when sodium begins to, I'm sorry, when potassium begins to leave the cell. So first, we're going to have this small number of sensitive low threshold, so sodium channels that are close to the gate threshold, they respond when we reach minus 55 millivolts. So we get this small number of sodium channels to open, and we get this initial what's called a slow sodium influx. Now, as we first get this first initial slow sodium influx, this is going to continually change the voltage characteristics in the axon hillock, leading to more sodium channels to respond and to open. And this causes an increasing amount of sodium, so more sodium begins to enter the cell, and it's going to pour in, it's going to flood into the cell. These events are repeated over and over, where we basically have an initial group of sodium channels that open up, they cause another group to open up, which causes another group to open up, which causes another group to open up. And this is happening over a very short amount of time, just a matter of milliseconds or less, but it does result in a positive feedback loop. Positive feedback loop where more and more and more sodium is going to begin to pour into the cell until we get this very large spike over a short amount of time uh, leading past zero millivolts up around plus 35 millivolts. Now, those gated sodium channels, when our potential, our action potential, or our change in voltage reaches about zero millivolts, all of those sodium channels that have opened up and allowed sodium to cross into the cell, that channel begins to close. Now, sodium influx is going to stop when we reach about 35 plus 35 millivolts. Okay, so as you can see here, here's my voltage on the Y. Stimulus comes in, we get this change in this initial first slow change, get to the voltage uh, threshold, and then shoot all the way up to plus 35. 
Now, at this point, the composition of sodium inside of the cell is going to be very, very hot. But it's basically going to be stuck in the cell because those channels have closed down. Sodium has poured into the cell. So if nothing else were to happen here, we would just remain at 35 millivolts, and we really would have no signal that would be generated. We just have this increase in voltage, and we get stuck there. But that's not really going to be the case. We're going to have some other things that are going to happen. So before we go there, the intercellular fluid is now going to be more positive compared to the extracellular fluid. And our resting membrane potential is said to be reversed. We've gone from minus 70 millivolts now to plus 35 millivolts. Now at this point where we have our peak, so this point right here between the two and the three, our action potential peaks out. No more sodium is entering the cell. However, remember that we had slow chain, uh, potassium channels that have been signaled to open. So now they're fully open. And so potassium is going to begin to leave the cell in a large amount. Now, the intercellular fluid, plus 35 millivolts, means that it has a pretty large positive charge. And that positive charge is going to push our positively charged potassium outward. So not only do we have the concentration gradient favoring the movement of potassium from inside the cell out of the cell, but there's also a large positive influence now that's also pushing the potassium out of the cell. Now, as that positive influence carried by the potassium, as the potassium begins to leave, we're going to begin to decrease our voltage. Now, we're going back towards our minus 70 millivolts, which was polarized, and so now we're repolarized. So repolarization is occurring as the potassium leaves through the now fully open channel, moved by its concentration gradient and the influence of the positive inside of the cell. These potassium channels are actually going to remain open for a longer amount of time than the sodium channels. And by staying open for a longer amount of time, that means we have more potassium that can leave than sodium that enter. So just to kind of give an example of this, if we had a million molecules of sodium that entered the cell, we may have 2 million potassium molecules that left, or 1.5 million potassium molecules that leave. The consequence of this is that our membrane potential doesn't just return to minus 70 millivolts. It actually returns to about minus 72 millivolts. And so we end up 1 to 2 millivolts lower than the resting membrane potential, lower than where we had started. Because we've gone past our minus 70 millivolts, we said this was polarized, we've hyperpolarized. We've gone beyond polarization. So we have hyperpolarized. Now at this point, if you really sit down and think about it, we started out with a large amount of sodium 
This is my extracellular fluid. This is my intracellular fluid. A large amount of sodium outside, a smaller amount inside, a large amount of potassium in, uh, on the inside, and a smaller amount outside. Then we go to our action potential. Extracellular fluid here. Here's our membrane, our intracellular fluid. We've now reversed where we have a small amount of sodium, a large amount of sodium here, small amount of potassium in, large amount of potassium out. So the ions are now in opposite fluids. They've reversed. But before we can respond once again, we have to revert back to that original condition, back to our true resting membrane potential, right around minus 70 millivolts, rather than that 1 to 2 millivolt, minus 72 millivolt difference after hyperpolarization. Remember that we have sodium potassium pumps that are almost always active. They're basically always active, always pumping sodium out and potassium in. However, when sodium and potassium channels open up during an action potential, they get overrun. The pumps can't keep up. And so we get our action potential, but now that potassium channels have also closed, the sodium and potassium pumps can have a greater influence. And so in a very short amount of time, these pumps are going to burn an ATP molecule. We're going to move sodium back into the extracellular fluid. And we're going to move potassium back into the intracellular fluid. And we're going to account for that 1 to 2 uh, negative millivolt hyperpolarization. And we're going to return the whole patch of membrane that's just gone through an action potential back to its resting membrane potential. Now, this whole process that I just described here, this would occur at one small patch of membrane. So if I draw out a membrane here. So here's my membrane. Let's say that the local potential comes in and stimulates the membrane here. We're going to have all of our different proteins and, and channels and everything. And so we're going to have our sodium that rushes in and then potassium that rushes out. And this is going to generate that characteristic action potential wave. This action potential is specific or is happening just in a small little patch of membrane. Now, we have changes in the voltage that are occurring here on either side in the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid that have an influence on this next patch of membrane. And so then we would have a second patch of membrane that would go through another action potential influencing the next patch of membrane, so on and so forth. And this is how we can move an action potential along a, me a membrane such as the axon membrane in a neuron. So let's take a look now at some characteristics of actual potentials. So the first characteristic that I want to take a look at is called the all or none principle. The all or none principle. And what the all or none principle states is that a neuron, if it is depolarized by an initial stimuli to threshold, then we'll see an action potential that's generated that has its maximal voltage characteristics. The converse of this is to see a neuron that when depolarized does not reach threshold. Resulting in no firing 
of that neuron. Collectively, we can now state that the strength of the stimuli will not determine the strength of the actual potential fire. And this image here illustrates this. So you can see this is our threshold level. And if we have smaller uh, stimuli, these would be local potentials that don't cause the neuron, the membrane, to reach our threshold. You can see there's just a little tiny blip and there's no signal that's going to be produced. There would be no sensation for, let's say, if these were uh, neurons leading towards a sensation of pain or something like that. If this happened, you'd feel nothing. However, if we have a stimuli comes in and it reaches that 55 millivolt, minus 55 millivolt threshold, we get a full action potential. Now, notice here, compare this threshold stimuli to this super threshold stimuli. There are two different sizes. This is a much bigger stimuli. But the end result, the resulting action potential, is identical. I could take this action potential and lay it on top of this action potential, and they are mirror images of each other. So every time we reach threshold, we are going to get the exact same maximal action potential produced every single time. And that's going to be the all or none principle. Now, if you remember, local potentials were considered to degrade or they uh, were influenced to go through decrement. The action potential is non-decremental. So it falls in non-decrement principle. And that's what's illustrated here in this particular figure. And what this means is the strength of an action potential is going to be preserved to the very end of the neuron. In other words, if we reach threshold in the, so this here, by the way, just to give you an, an orientation to these figures, this is distance. So this would be from the axon hillock and down here towards the neuron. And you can see that we've measured four different action potentials and they all look identical. The top of the peak is all the same. So there's no loss of signal. The signal is going to just persist. We, we can continue to lay on more and more of these until we got to the end of the neuron. Here is what it would look like if it was a local potential. You can see the magnitude is changing. We actually have a decrease in the amplitude or the peak of the signal that's being generated. Eventually, given a long enough distance, we're eventually going to run out. We're eventually going to disappear. The, the signal will, will be lost. It will degrade and it will no longer exist. Now, this particular principle or characteristic of action potentials allows action potentials to travel much longer distances than the local potential. The local potential is going to travel from the dendrite to the trigger zone in the axon hillock. This is really just a couple of microns, a very small distance. Whereas the action potential may travel from the axon hillock all the way down the axon throughout the rest of the neuron to a muscle that's in the foot. And this could be a distance of over a meter. And so with an action potential, we can uh, allow those action potentials to travel a much longer distance because they do not degrade or undergo decrement. A third characteristic is action potentials are irreversible. Once a patch of membrane at the axon hillock or after reaches threshold, so once threshold is reached, that neuron is going to send an action potential all the way down to its target organ or tissue, and that target organ or tissue is going to respond. And so if it's a muscle, that muscle is going to contract. We're going to have firing of that neuron. 
or that neuron is going to be stimulated to release a neurotransmitter onto another neuron. Now, there is a characteristic known as refractory, or a refractory period. A refractory period is going to be a time after a portion of membrane just responded by generating a action potential. So I'm going to say that the membrane just fired. After the membrane has just fired, we're going to have a small amount of time where it's either near impossible or is impossible to fire again. So it's either going to be near impossible or completely impossible which means we're going to have two different types of refractory and they're going to occur within two different regions of the of the uh, of the action potential now this does not this principle here does not necessarily apply to the whole neuron. Okay, so just because a patch of membrane, let's say we have our membrane here, and we stimulate here and we're in refractory, that doesn't, that means that this piece of membrane cannot no longer respond. But this piece of membrane over here still may actually be able to respond to a stimuli. Okay, so this patch of membrane, if it's in refractory, does not necessarily mean that this patch of membrane further down the neuron would be in refractory at the same time. Okay, so a refractory period is going to last a period of time. And so we're going to have this moment of time after or during the firing of a neuron, generation of an action potential, when no additional action potentials can be produced. And we're going to have two phases or two types of refractory. Okay, And you can see here that we have an absolute refractory period and we have a relative refractory period. An absolute refractory period means that no matter what we do, no matter how big of a stimuli we provide to that patch of membrane in that neuron, we're not going to get another action potential generated. So this absolute refractory period is going to occur during depolarization and repolarization. So on this figure here, you can see that in blue is our absolute refractory period. So our stimuli comes in. Here's our first initial stimuli, this little blip here. And we begin to go through refractory. If I bring in a second stimuli, and it happens during this depolarization, repolarization, no matter how big this stimuli is, this stimuli could be this big or even bigger, there's not going to be a, an additional signal that happens. And this plays back to that all or none principle. Basically, we've involved all of the sodium and potassium channels in that patch of membrane that we can, and there are no more sodium or potassium channels that can open up to allow more sodium and potassium to cross during the generation of the action potential. So no signal is going to be big enough to open up sodium channels and potassium channels that do not exist. Now, this uh, absolute refractory period, it occurs during the depolarization, repolarization, and it ends when the membrane returns to its resting membrane potential. So you can see here that we've returned to resting membrane potential. This is the end of our
absolute refractory period. And again, this occurs due to the open sodium channels. We have no additional sodium channels that we can open up, so we say that the membrane is going to be saturated by sodium movement. Now, notice that once we get to this point of threshold, remember that we would really have this little dip here that we would call hyperpolarization. During that phase, when the voltage of the membrane is exceedingly lower than our normal resting membrane potential, we are going to have what's known as relative refractory. So relative re refractory, this phase is going to occur while the membrane is hyperpolarized. While the membrane is hyperpolarized. So in other words, when we've reached, when we've moved back down past our minus 70 millivolts. So whenever we're below minus 70 millivolts, we'd be in relative refractory. And what this means is that we can actually fire or refire the, the patch of membrane if and when we have a strong enough stimuli. So you can see here in this figure, I have a stimuli that comes in here, can't cause a second action potential to occur because we're an absolute refractory, but that stimuli comes in a little bit later. We've now moved out of, we've gone um, back down below threshold. We can bring in another stimuli and we get this smaller, but uh, an action potential none the same. Okay, so another action potential form. And notice here, once we've left, uh, that relative, we get the exact same signature again. So we can repeat that action potential and it will have the exact same waveform. So this is going to happen because we have potassium flow across the membrane that will balance any of the sodium. Thanks. 